that we are Christian soldiers marching on to war. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 5 to 12 is where we find ourselves this morning as we're coming near the conclusion, the completion of studying through this letter, uh, what we understand to be Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. Uh, it's been a, quite a study. We entitled this overarching theme of the book as the, uh, the perfect gospel for an imperfect church. Paul continues to point them back to the gospel as the answer, as the remedy, as he points out the many areas of concern that he legitimately has with this church. As I've said to you several times through this study, the encouraging thing is with all of the stuff he's dealing with there, with all of the aberrations, with all of the wrong thinking, he still introduces this letter to the church at Corinth. Every church is an imperfect church. The goal that Christians should have uh, individually, and we read it again in Romans 8, is to be conformed increasingly to the image of Jesus Christ. And in that desire, that uh, that agenda for us as we make our way to heaven, we should come together in local clusters called local congregations, local churches, and then be striving together, provoking one another to love and good works, the scripture says in Hebrews. That we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, become more like him, think more like him, act more like him, speak more like him, respond more like him increasingly like Jesus Christ. And as churches do that, then the imperfections uh, are begin to dissipate. When we fail to do that, then the imperfections will accumulate. Uh, and so Corinth, at the time that Paul writes this letter, is in what seems to be an accumulating phase of imperfections as he's listed many of them throughout the letter. So we began last week looking at, uh, at the first uh, consideration of these verses, verses 5 to 12. Stand with me if you would, uh, and I hope you have your Bible. If you don't, we've got the text on the screen for you. Uh, I want you to see, I always want you to see in the Scriptures what you hear from this pulpit or what you hear from any of the teaching lecterns in our Bible study classes. Follow along as I read. Verses 5 to 12, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, the ESV. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia. And perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. What have we read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And I pray today that we will, we will uh, get fitted better with this idea that with gospel opportunity always comes opposition to the gospel. The fear of opposition to the gospel, the shrinking back, which is sort of a uh, endemic of the church in the West robs us of great opportunities. And Paul teaches us this in this text. Thank you. Please be seated. I told you last week that there's, uh, that there's not uh, a lot of teaching, didactic material in this as we've had throughout the letter. Uh, this is more uh, what we call exhortive. Uh, he, is, he is challenging them. As he informs them, there's narrative here, but he's challenging them uh, in the light of what he's telling them. He's just 
told them in the end of chapter 15, remember, that your, your labor be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For you know, you should know, you need to know, you need to have the conviction of this, that your labor is not ever in vain in the Lord. And he even mentions in this portion of the, of the text that Timothy is doing the work of the Lord as, as he is. It's part of the basis for him exhorting them how to receive Timothy. These things had to do with the work of the Lord. I think, it's, I think John MacArthur's commentary, he talks about doing the Lord's work the Lord's way. I think that's his emphasis in, throughout this passage. Uh, and I think it's also in that that he mentions that he distills the work of the Lord to two primary things, evangelizing and edifying. Evangelizing and edifying. We've said this many times through the 14 years I've been with you. If you think about why the Lord leaves you here, and I've had some conversations with people who are keenly aware that they're approaching the end of their lives, and we, we talk about these things, my own, my own sister and then Brother Charlie Ward as we talk to him. Why the Lord leaves you here? It is to be about these two tasks. Evangelizing the lost, that is, sharing the gospel with those who do not yet know Jesus Christ, who if they come to their end, if they come to die without Christ, they will spend an eternity in hell apart from him. And those of us who know we are going to heaven, uh, who have been saved by grace through faith, when we, when we think about it, we cannot stand the thought of that happening to anyone we know. We really cannot stand the thought of that happening to anyone. Even, even the most uh, vocal enemy of the gospel today, if you think about what hell is, and the scripture describes it in such, such graphic, horrifying terms. It is a place where the, where the fire burns but never completely consumes. If you've ever uh, touched your hand on a, on a hot plate or or had a, now this, I've never had this issue, but with a curling iron, uh, touched your scalp with a curling iron. Think about that, that immediate hurt, that immediate pain of the burn, and that never stopping. It never diminishing. It just continues unabated. It, it intensifies. It, the scripture says that's what hell is, where the, where the fire burns, but never burns to an end. Even a piece of wood you put on a fireplace or on a, on a fire outside will, will come to ashes. Not so in hell. It describes it as a place where the, where the worm consumes. The picture here is of the decaying corpse where, where maggots begin to eat and if you give them time they will eat the rotting flesh down to the bone. Not so in hell. The worm consumes but never finishes. It's talked about a place of outer darkness, of utter darkness, where you can't see. You and I have been in situations. You've probably been in a cave. Uh, I remember standing, I've told you this before, but on the back porch of a little cabin on the back side of, of uh, Pikes Peak, where Cripple Creek was running along it. And, and you stepped out, and there was no ambient light, just the, just the stars above, but it took a while. I mean, you couldn't literally put your hand right here, and you could not see your hand in front of your face. Now, after a while, with the ambient light of, the, of all the brilliant stars, things begin, your eyes focus. But we're not, that doesn't happen in hell. Utter darkness. And those are just some of the descriptions. You can't really describe the painfulness of hell. And so we should be moved as those who were loved enough by somebody who told us the gospel, someone who shared the gospel with us. You didn't figure it out on your own. You weren't sitting contemplating eternity one day and then it dawned on you. Somebody put a Bible in your hand. Somebody sat down and took the time to talk with you about Jesus. Somebody prayed for you. Evangelizing, that's, that's one of the two uh, primary works of the Lord, Paul has said, that is not in vain. When you share the gospel, that's never in vain. And then edify. Those who, who know the Lord, we should be building one another up. 
encouraging one another. As I said earlier, provoking one another to love and good works. We, the church should not be the place where people are torn down, where people are undermined, where people are, are abused emotionally, physically, sexually, whatever. The, that's, the church is to be, and all this talk today about safe places, safe places, the church should be the safest place on earth. Saved sinners should be able to grow in grace in the context of a ministry where, where we're taught to edify one another and build one another up. Yes, there's, there's a place in the Scripture to, to examine yourself, whether you're really in the faith, to make your calling and election sure, to, to use the word to rebuke uh, and reprove. All those things are a part of it. But the overarching climate in a local church of Jesus Christ should be edifying. We ought to all be contributing to the edification. When, when we, when we uh, shirk our responsibility, when we leave the gathering to, to others, there's no way we can build others up. You may not realize this. When you walk into a Bible study class, your presence encourages somebody in there. You may not think about it that way, but I promise you. And I promise you this pastor is encouraged when I see you. It's edifying. And others are too. They may not tell you that, but they are. It's good to see saints who've walked with the Lord for, for decades faithfully continuing on. It's good to see young believers who have recently come to Christ showing uh, that, that desire to be among the people of God. It ought to thrill us when God is pleased to bring guests our way. And we ought, to, we ought to do everything we can to make sure that we edify one another and them that there's a sense of, I'm home. I'm home. I was watching uh, uh, American Ninja Warrior, whatever we call it, and uh, a woman who's one of the top athletes apparently in this I wasn't watching it thinking I might participate so that I was just watching it out of curiosity and uh, and she was had to be absent last year because she had a, a, some other things she had to deal with so she came back and she finished the course and and they said how do you feel And she said I'm home I'm home and we ought to do what we can to make sure that one another feels home when we come together like this. And so there's, these, there's this work of the Lord that we want to engage in. We talked about that. Uh, and you see it in Paul's life. He said, I make it my aim. I'm going to take the gospel where it's never been before. But he didn't just do that. As he was pressing the boundaries, pressing, pressing, pressing to put the gospel where it had never been before, he would circle back around and visit. He says in our text here, I hope to come see you again. Corinth, the church where there had not been a church, a place where there had not been a church, and he establishes a church there. But he was doing both, evangelizing, edifying. And we must be too. So we looked at this last week under, under six headings. First, being on mission for God requires determination. Uh, then being on mission for God requires perseverance. Being on mission for God requires opportunities. Pardon me, I jumped over. Content recognizes their contingencies. Then third, requires perseverance. Fourth, uh, recognizes opportunities are often met with opposition. And fifth, being on mission for God recognizes that it takes a team. And finally, requires spiritual discernment. We looked last week at this being on mission uh, for God requires determination. He, he says, I will. He's not boasting here. When, he's, when he says, I will, he's not, he's not forgotten the, the uh, context that James suggests. That we, don't boast as if tomorrow we do this if the Lord wills. But that's, that's just what drives Paul is the Lord's will. If the Lord wills, I will come back through. It's within my power to do something through. And then the second thing where he, that there are contingencies. He says, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. His, his plans had changed, remember. His plans had changed. And so he was, you have to be adaptable. You've got to be flexible. If you're going to be engaged in ministry, inflexibility will choke the life out of you. You've got to, you've got to move. You've got to, you know, 
A man makes his plans. What does the rest of the proverb say, though? But the Lord directs his steps. You intend to minister. The door closes. You look forward to a follow-up opportunity. It doesn't come. People make promises and they don't follow through. That will drive you stark, raving mad. If you're not flexible, if you don't recognize that you just, you have to, you plan. This is one of the writers I was reading said, said Paul, Paul had a plan that he could change. In other words, it's not like there was no plan. He had a plan that he could change. He was flexible. And so we talked about that. Then third, uh, the, the perseverance. For I do not want to see you just now in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. Um, I told you why I didn't want to see them just now. All these previous 15 chapters tell you why he didn't want to see them just now. He needed to spend some time with them to bring some corrective to see what would happen. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. And that's what led us into this, uh, where we were looking last week when we had to stop. Being on mission for God recognizes opportunities are often met with opposition. He says, I'm going to stay in Pentecost, stay in Ephesus till Pentecost. I will be there a little longer because an opportunity has been presented to me. You know, as Christians, in our prayer life, Part of our prayer life ought to be to pray for opportunities. Dear God, you think about people you work with, neighbors you live around. Dear God, open a door there. Help me be sensitive uh, as you open the door to witness to this neighbor, to this coworker, to this relative, to this person I may meet in the marketplace who engages me in a conversation. Help me to be sensitive that you're opening a door. An opportunity is being presented. Don't let me squander an opportunity. We do it. We just need to confess it. It's not the unpardonable sin. We need to confess it and pray, dear God, forgive me and help me to be more alert next time that comes around. He says a, a, a wide door. Isn't it interesting? When the Scripture typically speaks of wide paths and wide openings, it's about the wrong path, the path of destruction. But not when you're talking about gospel ministry, not when you're talking about looking for gospel opportunities. And the point here, I think, is that Paul didn't, didn't he wasn't looking through a little crack in the door thinking, I don't, I don't know if this is an opportunity or not. The Lord opens the door and invites us to walk through. And if your prayer life doesn't involve that right now, let me just challenge you to add that portion to it. When you pray for people, for example, we all have a list of people who have not yet come to faith in Christ, and we, we long to see them saved. But as we pray for them, and even pray sometimes, Lord, send someone into their path to impress the gospel upon them, and cause them to receive it. Let's go ahead and say, and Lord, let that someone be me. If you're like me, particularly when it comes to relatives sometimes, you think I've shared the gospel, I've shared the gospel, I've shared the gospel. There's no, I have nothing left to say to them that they haven't already heard. And I had to rebuke myself about that when I think that, because see, here's the deal. You can share the gospel with them because they haven't heard it yet. You may have spoken it in their presence, it may have bounced around in their, in their ear canal as words, but they haven't heard the gospel. You and I were saved. I will remind you, we were saved when we heard the gospel, when it pierced us, when it penetrated us, when it went beyond whether it was mom or dad or a friend or a Sunday school teacher or a preacher talking to you, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. It went beyond that. It's as if... I remember it. It was as if Jesus cleared the room and said, I'm, t I'm talking to you. This is me talking to you. Because I'd heard 
You know my background. I, I'd heard the gospel from the earliest days I was able to hear with understanding. My mother shared the gospel with me on her knees. She sang the gospel to me. Faithful teachers taught me. Faithful preachers preached. So you see, don't let the devil lie to you about that. There's not another thing I can tell them that they haven't already heard. Yes, there is. It's the good news of Jesus Christ who came to save sinners, who died in the place of sinners, who rose again three days later in the place of sinners, and who proved infallibly that he was accepted by God to take away your sin and give you life. So we need to think about these opportunities and add that to our prayer list. A wide door for effective work has opened to me. That's not all he says. And there are many adversaries. Let me tell you something. You and I can take our ease in the hammock of the knowledge that we have peace with God and that heaven is our home when we die. And it will not bother the enemy of our souls one bit. In fact, he hopes we stay at ease. He hopes we relax. Just like the enemies of our country hope that new recruits don't go and join our military and train to become lethal weapons. Our enemies know that. You remember the scene. It was historically accurate. After the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, one of the commanders was saying, we have done it. And another one of the commanders said, I fear we have just awakened a sleeping giant. That's how the devil feels about you and me if we get lethargic, if we get comfortable in our Christianity. There's a difference, folks. The God of all comfort expects us to de de derive great comfort from him, knowing who he is and what he has done for sinners and what he intends to do, that he, he's able to save us to the uttermost. He is able to bring us safely home. He is the God of all comfort. We ought to derive much comfort. We ought to derive comfort from knowing that he works in all things, all things we're experiencing in our lives for his glory and for our good. He's the God of all comfort. But the God of all comfort never expects us to become comfortable. Any more than you would be encouraged to hear that we have an army that's asleep. That we, have a, we have a police force that sleeps on the job, that when they send patrol cars out, that those in the cars just fall asleep and take their ease. You, that wouldn't comfort you at all. Or that if the, if the alarm was sounded at the fire department and your house was on fire, that they're just sound asleep. They've, in fact, they've taken a cloth and they've muted the little bell alarm so that they, it doesn't bother them when it goes on. You, that wouldn't comfort you at all. God expects us. There's a term used for this. It's called the church militant. And it's contrasted with the church triumphant. The church triumphant is, is all of the departed believers who have gone to be with the Lord. They have, they have triumphed. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith, and their faith has been realized. But we are the church militant. We have not yet passed from this life to the life which is to come. And the term militant should get you. Military comes from that, of course. It's the idea that we, we have an agenda. And our agenda it's, doesn't use the weapons of the world. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, but they are mighty, and they tear down strongholds. I told you last week, we have enemies coming against the church. We don't need to hate them. They hate us enough for both of us, okay? 
But they're enemies. Radical feminism is an enemy. And it resents and hates the fact that evangelical conservative churches recognize that the Scripture teaches that when it comes to standing and preaching the Word of God in the pulpits of the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he has called men to do that exclusively. And radical feminists hate that. And you're going to find them in some strange places. If I were to suggest to you that Beth Moore has become a radical feminist, you would go, preacher, that can't be. Lifeway sells more of her stuff than anybody else's. Yet she boasted on Mother's Day, I'll be preaching in the pulpit of my home church on Mother's Day this weekend. Now I want all the Calvinists to chew on that. Radical feminism is an enemy of the gospel, an enemy of the church of Jesus Christ. Islam is an enemy of the gospel. Don't let anybody fool you. Moderate Islam is in the same category as the mythical carnal Christianity. Islam is about dominating. And Christianity is about freedom. It's Christianity that, that, that this country was built upon that came up with ideas like freedom of speech. In Islam, there is no freedom of speech. Freedom of the press. There is no freedom of the press in Islam. Freedom to assemble. Freedom for redress. Freedom of, of religion. There is no freedom of religion in Islam. Islam is the religion or you're, or you're dead. It's an enemy of the gospel. It's an enemy of the church and it's making incredible inroads into this country. We shouldn't be surprised that the, that the Arab nations are predominated by this or that Indonesia is the largest Muslim population in the world. It shouldn't surprise us. The gospel hasn't made its inroads there. But a, but a country founded upon the gospel of Jesus Christ to, in the name of freedom, let this pernicious philosophy masquerading as a religion invade our country and lead people in chants like no borders, no walls, no USA at all. Islam is an enemy of the gospel. We have our enemies. The LGBTQ plus agenda is an enemy of the gospel because they see us as foolish enough to believe that when Jesus says in Matthew's gospel, have you not read that in the beginning he made them male and female, biological male, biological female, not to be changed. That's hate speech to the LGBTQ plus agenda. Antifa. Black Lives Matter. All these groups are subversive groups. People say, well, Pastor, that's being political. They're, they're, sub, they're, they're subverting the USA. Well, it is theological because they have at their core a hatred for the God of Scripture. So, we don't need to hate them. But we need to be aware. We need to be wise about them and know how we relate to this. There are many adversaries. Joshua mentioned it in his prayer. We pray for the persecuted church around the world. I've told you this for years. There was probably a time back when I said this that some people snickered and thought, boy, our preacher is really a conspiracy theorist. I've told you for years. It's coming here. And it is here. Not in the numbers that you see it elsewhere. It hadn't made it to the top 50 yet. In Oklahoma City, a woman who was a Christian in a factory setting was beheaded by a Muslim. Why? Because she was a Christian. Wasn't because she worked harder than he did. People are being sent to jail in this country for passing out evangelistic tracts at LBGTQ rallies. Suggesting that Christians should take back the rainbow, that the rainbow belongs to God as, as an ark of his promise that he will never again destroy the earth by flood. Even though he tells us later he will destroy the earth by fire. Suggesting that is, is called appropriate. You're, you're, you're appropriating that from the LGBTQ crowd. 
There are many adversaries, folks. We need to understand what Paul is teaching here. And I would tell you this. We need to learn to see that, not as a discouraging thing to think, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? If there are many adversaries, why does Paul tell us there would be many adversaries? Because a wide door of opportunity for the gospel has been opened to us. And it must be our conviction to walk through it, no matter what, to walk through it. He would remind us. That, remember I told you last week, G. Campbell Morgan said, if you have no opposition in the place you serve, you're serving in the wrong place. Ephesians 6, 12, Paul said this, well, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You see, we need to see people, radical feminists, Muslims, lesbians, gays, transgenders, as sinners in need of a savior. But understand that they are pawns used by these spiritual forces, these powers, these cosmic powers in heavenly places. So that we pray for them. God, give me an opportunity to share the gospel with such. Knowing it may have a cost attached to it. Do you have adversaries now? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 to 10, We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Put yourself there. What Paul is saying is it was so intense, so unrelenting, that I said, Lord, let me die. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Uh, it makes you want to jump, doesn't it? Hebrews tells us that when Isaac when Abraham took Isaac up on the mountain, commanded by God to sacrifice your son, your only son, to me. Hebrews says he was willing to be obedient to God by faith, believing, how far was he willing to go? Believing that God was able to give him back his son from the dead again. Do you believe that about your God? He's the God who raises the dead. What then can men do to us? We read in Romans 8 earlier, I'm persuaded that neither life nor death, and he goes through this catalog of things, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Famine, peril, sword, nothing. Nothing will. None of it, if it comes to you, means that you've been separated from your God. He delivered us, verse 10, from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. And Paul did see, if you follow his ministry, delivery after delivery after delivery, until finally it was God's plan. Now we're back to when I've talked to Brother Charlie Ward and to my sister. Brother Charlie looks you in the eye sincerely and says, Pastor, I'm ready to go home. I don't know why the Lord leaves me here. And I said to him, Brother, every time, Brother, I don't, I don't pretend to know the mind of God in that detailed way, but here's what I do know. That God is using you here as a blessing to others. And when you've blessed the last person he intends for you to bless. I said this to my sister when she was lying in the hospital. If, you're, if you don't leave this hospital, 
when the last person has walked in here to care for you and you have blessed them with gospel blessings, the last person God intends, you're going home. And that's true of you and that's true of me. And so the best way we spend our time is looking for those opportunities to bless people, whether it's to bless them with the gospel because they do not yet know Christ or to bless them in the gospel because they've come to faith and they're growing and we want to be a part of that encouragement. A wide door is open. And when that happens, there are many adversaries. And so you can see it one of two ways in this text. Either when the Lord opens a wide door, prepare for many adversaries. As I said, the devil doesn't care if, you, if you're snoozing, if you're napping. doesn't bother him at all. But the moment you wake up, I read a, a joke some time ago where you get out of bed in the morning, you put your feet on the floor, does the devil say, oh no, he's awake. That's what we ought to be to the powers of darkness. Something that troubles them. They're concerned. They're fine as long as we sleep. But when we're awake, the powers of darkness tremble. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can't endure. For lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall bring him down. And that word, above all earthly powers, no thanks to the devil abides. The Spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sides. Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also the body they may kill. God's truth abides still because his kingdom is forever. That's the mentality we have to have. Looking for opportunities, expecting opposition, and not being coward in the face of it. In fact, I would challenge you when opposition comes, be emboldened because that means God is doing something through you that you may not see yourself. The next thing, quickly, being on mission recognizes that it takes a team. It's been said there is no I in team. It's not me, my, mine, I. So Paul says, when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he's doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me for I'm expecting him with the brothers. It's so easy in a critical age to despise others. We don't know why Timothy was despised, but twice Paul says that. He says it to a church one time, then he says it to Timothy himself. Let no one despise your youth. We don't know if he uh, had a timid demeanor or, or if he, if he was, had some insecurities. But folks, we're a team. A church of the Lord Jesus Christ, a local visible gathering, is a team. And on a team, you're either in there with the team, laboring, supporting, playing your role, or you're not supportive, so you become uh, dead weight in a team, or you're antagonistic to the team. And believe me, don't be naive, churches have all three. They have all three. People who are just coasting, depending on others, it's a weight. People who've decided to be antagonistic. You wouldn't believe the things I see standing up here that you never see, because you're looking at me. It'd curl your hair. Part of the reason I probably don't have any here. 
People walk in, look around, walk out, they can there's something behind you. We're a team. Paul recognizes that. And if you read through the letters, you know, he lamented at times, everyone has deserted, everyone's abandoned. But Paul was always promoting the team. He was always encouraging and edifying to those who were being faithful. And here he does it with Timothy. He's coming. I'm going to send this letter with him. Receive him, bless him, encourage him, edify him, strengthen him. Don't despise him. Recognize he's doing the work of the Lord like I am and, and tell him so. It takes a team, brothers and sisters. I want to just, where are you on the team? Where are you? It's getting dark. The night's coming, Jesus said, when no one will be able to work anymore. Where are you? Finally, requires spiritual discernment, being on mission with God. Look at verse 12. And I told you we're going to pick this verse up. We'll move to the next section. So I'm just going to read it and comment on it briefly. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. Here is the counterbalance. We tend to be out of, out of, out of work, you know. There's some who think, well, if, if, if evangelizing is my responsibility, I need to evangelize everybody I see. I need to engage. And, and you know, you can, in that kind of zeal, sometimes it's, a, it's an inopportune time. You don't walk in... If I walked up to the men's fragrance counter at some department store to look at fragrance, maybe I'm going to get, maybe it's women's, I'm going to get my wife something. And I begin to engage that person, it's okay to drop gospel thoughts, but if I try to tie that person up right there with a gospel explanation and that individual clearly is not in a frame, that is untimely. So there's got to be discernment. He said, I, want, I told Apollos, come, go see him, Apollos. Apollos said, I'm not, now's not the time for me. You have to be discerning. Don't ever use that. There's two ditches. Don't use that as an excuse not to. I don't think any of us will get to heaven and the Lord will say, now, welcome. But I want to tell you, you, you went way overboard sharing the gospel. I didn't intend for you to share the gospel. I don't think we'll ever hear that. I don't think it's possible. But we have to be discerning. It's, it's, it's a timely, in, in the ninth commandment, you should not tell, bear false witness. The positive thing is that you need to tell the truth always. And there's a timely telling of the truth, and the gospel is the truth. And so you have to be sensitive to people, not obnoxious. That's why we trained folks when we went door to door years ago during the faith evangelism training. Knock on the door. If they welcome you, greet them. If we have our greeters bag, give it to them. If they'll take it, engage them, find out about them. If it's clear that they, uh, that, that they don't, I was at one house one night, and you could hear Monday night football blaring in the background, you know. And this, this guy was talking to me, but he was talking reluctantly. And, and, and he was kind of backing away. I, I expected the door to slam any moment, so I said, look, you're busy right now. Just take this, and opportunity presents itself. We'd love to visit again. Because you want to leave a sweet aroma. There's already enough done in the name of Christianity that we, under the category of obnoxious. We don't need to be that. So you, you balance what we've been saying. here. Be discerning and to, in your prayers. Lord, help me to be that person and give me the discernment the spiritual understanding and wisdom to know that you've opened the door. And you're going to walk away sometime and go, oh, I blew that. That's learning. That's called learning. And you learn from that. So we make it about the gospel. And when we do, when it's about the gospel, chiefly, foremostly, opportunities are opened. Adversaries appear. Always have. Always will. Every country we've gone through thus far, believers there will tell you, yeah, that's what we've seen. And every country we're going to go through, from number 19 on to number 1, will tell you, yes, that's true. But oh, what opportunities God has given us. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we come to you today in Jesus' name, and so thankful for your word. So thankful for, for the ministry you gave the Apostle Paul, how we can learn from that ministry today. We can, we can recommit to be on mission for God, acknowledging to you that that's the only reason that we're alive today. We know you could have saved us and taken us straight to heaven that next moment, but you saved us and you've left us here. 
Help us to view life on mission for you. Help us to pray and, and seek and, and recognize opportunities to share the good news, to say to people, come, go with me. Help us to be faithful, to edify and build up. And forgive us when we're not edifying. Cleanse our tongue anew and afresh. Help us recognize we're in this together. That we're in this together. And to labor together till Jesus comes. We ask all this in his name and for his sake. Amen.